because it's such an important kind of pillar of Web3 that it was theorized as part of the Web3 vision in 2014. Right. It hasn't existed till now. There was a bit of a ruse to say that I'm using a decentralized network because it's there are thousands of nodes around the world. But really, your access to that decentralized network is via like one company. The last team wishes you good luck and Godspeed. Space Monkeys blasting off with Jonathan Dunn from Talisman. We're here to get to the bottom of light clients. What are they? How do they work? Is the opposite of light clients heavy or are they dark? We're going to figure it all out today. John, thanks for coming back on the show. Thanks for having me. It was such a quick turnaround time. I think the last time we spoke was June, and now it's August the again. Pe the people wanted more, and I just yeah. couldn't help but fly here and get it for them. Thanks for coming. It's a long way. <laughs> it's a long way. <laughs> no problem, dude. So, um, what's going on? You're here in Cambridge. Uh, we're in Cambridge for two reasons. It's kind of the back end of the Substrate Developer Academy, or the first edition of the Substrate Developer Academy, yeah. run by Parity. And there's also been a few workshops and, and things like that run by Parity uh, for the parachain and infrastructure teams in the ecosystem. Yeah. So it's been a, an intense few days, but really worthwhile coming. Recently saw that Gavin Wood retweeted your talk at Decoded. Yeah. where you were kind of announcing the integration of light clients into Talisman. Yeah. But I, I just I just don't get it. I just don't know how to explain it to other people. I don't know how to report on it even. Yeah. So maybe let's just start like with the basics. What's the opposite of a light client? It's I guess you could just say a normal client, like a, a okay. full node of the blockchain. It does all of the roles that a normal node on the network has to do. Kind of it stuff. does storage consensus and and networking. And networking, yeah, yeah. okay. These networks are a collection of different computers around the world or different agents around the world, and they have to agree on stuff. So yeah. they have to perform some kind of consensus, they have to be able to talk to each other, okay. and they have to be able to store the, store the information that they just agreed on. Yep. Um, but this is a pretty expensive and intensive process. Okay, uh, it takes specialized uh, hardware, takes uh, specialized knowledge. Yeah, and sometimes you might want to say, I want one of these agents, one of these nodes, that does only a couple of these tasks, which, um, which makes them a little, bit more, a little bit more versatile and able to perform some, some more specialized or, or have some different traits that are useful in different ways. Okay, so what would be some of those specialized tasks that we would want to kind of tease out of the full yeah. node? Like clients are actually a pretty common concept in blockchains and crypto. Okay. Um, they're often used for things like uh, networking and sending messages between chains. Mm -hmm. uh, so the Snow Bridge, uh, kind of Ethereum to Polkadot Bridge is using light clients to send messages. Yep. Uh, Cosmos are also doing some stuff with light clients for their kind of XCM equivalent. Mm -hmm. They do this little cute kind of signing ceremony between light clients, which takes that burden off of the full nodes who are kind of more responsible for the consensus kind of hard hitting computation. But what we're really interested in Talisman is uh, running these light clients, not on a server somewhere, kind of Amazon Web Services, GCP or something like that, but running them inside of the user's browser uh, to create what's kind of termed like a browser embedded light client. So yeah. I'm using Talisman and there's a light client running in my browser. What's it doing? Browser embedded light clients okay. is actually just the story of Web3, I think, I think for me. Um, if, you, if everyone kind of rolls back to Gavin's uh, What is Web3, I think was the title of the, of the blog post that he wrote in 2014. He kind of explains this re-engineering of the internet. Mm -hmm. uh, the premise is almost, the services that we were using are a little bit transparent, a little bit opaque. You know, we would be on, on graphical user interfaces, pressing buttons, interacting with different things. And then at some point we would send information and it kind of went into this black box, you know. Right. We didn't really know where that information went, who had access to it, what other bits of information was kind of composed with it, what information was taken away, how it changed. And there was an inability to verify what was happening with kind of our privacy or our information when we're using services on the internet. Right. So I guess one of the, the motivations for Web3 is to make this a little bit more verifiable and transparent. Mm -hmm. And actually, I think, uh, I think in the blog post, there are two names for Web3. One was Web3 and one was the post Snowden internet or the post Snowden web. Right. So it kind of articulates maybe what, maybe what this motivation is to re-engineer the services we have. And in this post, there were kind of four uh, pillars or maybe four characteristics that we need to hit in order to have the kind of uh, application landscape that allows us to build services which are more transparent and kind of on a scale of 
verify and trust, more towards verify and less away from trust. So you don't have to trust the service provider. And one of these uh, kind of four pillars was uh, termed kind of the integrated browser, where the thing that I'm using, whether it's like my phone or my desktop uh, computer, is part of these networks uh, in a way where I can see the information that I submit isn't going to get kind of augmented, transposed, or changed in any way before it gets to the service that I want to use. So our, our PC nodes, what's going on there? Somebody's, can, somebody's running that node? This is just what, this is what you might call a heavy node. Yeah. Just running on a computer somewhere. <laughs> okay. Um, and, and that's dangerous because the person who's running that hardware has access to this information or? Uh, well, in order for you to submit your transaction to the network, yeah. you need to first give it to them and uh -huh. then they submit to the network. And on my behalf. Yeah, and then, and, and then and kind maybe of, they might choose not to do it one day. Yeah, or they might choose to insert one of their transactions in front of yours ah. to make a game for themselves. Yes. Or they might choose to forward your information to someone else so ah. that they can do something with it before they submit it to the network. Ah. And it's not super transparent. Right. Uh, so instead, we can kind of bring back this responsibility to submit transactions to the network and get information from the network. We can bring this responsibility away from these kind of remote heavy nodes yeah. run by somebody else and bring it onto the user's browser with the browser embedded like client. So that's, that's a fantastic. So what are the drawbacks to doing this? Before I say drawbacks, I'll probably say, firstly, there's an obstacle, which is we need to have a like client that can be run in the browser because it's a really heavy, heavy task. You know, you've got to be able to communicate with the blockchain and then communicate to several different like entities on the blockchain so that you're decentralized and you're, you are a peer on the peer-to-peer -peer network. Interesting. And that's a pretty tough networking challenge. Yeah. It's way above my head. Yeah. Uh, but in order to create that, it's, it's like a reasonably challenging engineering task. Hmm. And it hasn't been done until Parity have created the Substrate Connect uh, or small dot like client uh, for Substrate Chains. Wow. That's really cool. Okay, so when we have this still slightly heavy in-browser <laughs> node, yeah. I mean, it must, it's doing less than a full node. A lot less, yeah. Those other seemingly important activities that nodes do, where are those happening? Those are happening on these heavy nodes. Okay. Uh, I mean, these guys have to, I say guys, these nodes, yeah. they have to keep a, a record of all of the information in the chain. Okay. And that's just not viable to put on the user's browser. The storage. It's a lot of stuff. And yeah. especially in something like .sama where there are many chains, it's right. totally like an order of magnitude more unviable. Yeah, okay. Uh, so this kind of large record of, of chain state isn't, uh, isn't stored in a light client, which makes it a lot more viable for you to run it on your phone or in your Google Chrome Brave desktop browser. Okay, so Parity made it possible. Do we need to do any configuration with the full nodes or do they just understand what's happening? The light client is a, is a peer on the network. Okay. Uh, you know, we can see that it's connected to dozens of other nodes. Right. Uh, and at that point, it's just one of the other actors kind of equal to everyone else. Interesting. Yeah. Okay, so what was so exciting about what you were announcing in Decoded? I think the performance is really remarkable. Okay. Um, because the concern was that great, we're going to have a decentralized kind of access point to these networks for the users. Sure. Uh, but then what's the compromise? It's the fact that the user has to run a bit of software that has to download all these logs and then do all this work to kind of keep up to date with what's happening on the chain oh. and run, essentially run part of the blockchain in your browser. And the concern was that that detracts from the user experience or that detracts from kind of the performance of the other applications on running on your computer. Yeah. But the really remarkable thing is that it's not that bad with the Substrate Light Client at the moment. And what we're seeing is that do a really rudimentary, what's, the, what's my kind of balance of a particular token? It only takes about a second more to kind of create the Light Client and then ask the, the Light Client for the information than to ask it from a regular node, which is, which is kind of negligible at that point. Sure. Uh, given the gain you're getting in decentralization. So are people going to be able to toggle this on and off? Yeah, it does make sense to give the user some agency to configure the amount of networks they're running that are connected via a light client to just make sure the performance is always pretty good. Yeah. But to an extent, we can automate this uh, in Talisman. We can maybe make it a library that does the network management for you so you don't have to think about these types of things because you just want to use an application. And, right. Uh, well, this is going to be my next question because yeah. based on what you're just saying there, like, do I have to run anything extra? 
on my computer to use the light client side. It's something installed in Talisman, so you don't need to it's change It's just anything. in Talisman. Yeah. Very impressive. This is impressive, uh, mainly by the parity team. It's, ah. it's really remarkable what they've managed to do. It feels yeah. like we've kind of scored, we scored a tap-in in football where someone's <laughs> dribbled across all the different players, <laughs> pass it to us, and we've, uh, <laughs> nice. we've, we've done some nice work to do this, to do this uh, network management stuff, but it's got to happen. And I think the final piece of the puzzle is that you really do need network participation as well. Like you need, you need a star and you need a Kala to do something on their end to enable these light clients. Is that right? Yeah. Uh, so currently the substrate connect light client or the small dot light client, I should probably say, yeah. is only configured for the, mm -hmm. I know, like the relay chain networks. This is uh, Polkadot, Kusama, and then the two test nets, uh, West End and Rococo. And these are using uh, a particular consensus mechanism that does work. And for the parachains to get their networks running on these light clients, there's a bit of work for them to, or maybe on Parity's side, to add support. Okay, so once somebody figures it out, everybody should be able to do it? Yeah, but the motivation is, is really there because it's such an important kind of pillar of Web3 that it was theorized as part of the Web3 vision in 2014. Right. It hasn't existed till now. Um, so, so the motivation is very high to, uh, to kind of roll this out across the ecosystem. It's a bit of a step up from other ecosystems that won't have this functionality. It's kind of one of the final ticks in the box uh, for Web3. Um, there was a bit of a ruse almost to say that I'm using a decentralized network because it's there are thousands of nodes around the world, but really your access to that decentralized network is via like one company. So we're talking like, uh, what's it on Ethereum? Like, what, what's the one company that pretty much infer, infer or something yeah. like that? Yeah, as a wallet provider, we have to ensure that our users always have access to the network. Um, that even if service providers misconfigure something or, yeah. or regulatory action happens, uh, that people always have access to the information on the network and have access to the ability to then make a transaction. Yeah. Uh, you know, you don't want that that removed. It's not super decentralized if that happens. Um, yeah. Well, I heard that like actually like MetaMask and Infra are actually like really connected. You don't have to confirm or deny that, but I just, you I know, think, I heard it's pretty. I think Consensus, the parent company, uh, owns them both. So that's ah. like some like centralization risk Absolutely. Uh, for that wallet to an extent. We can solve this by using lots of providers, but the really the blue chip gold standard solution is just use a light client. I was actually trying to completely delete MetaMask the other day using Talisman, yeah. and I got really close. The only thing I couldn't do is um, Ledger EVM account, but that's yeah. on the way. Uh, yeah, we've got support for like the substrate Ledger applications yeah. for Polkadot and Kusama. Yeah. Uh, but kind of the next uh, cab off of the taxi rank is is to do the the Ethereum Edge application. So okay, so you can take that'll that be box. so sweet. Because yeah. then I also learned recently that like any application that supports MetaMask, even if it doesn't have the the Talisman logo, Talisman will still kick in. That's right. And 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 work. Yeah, um, there are lots of applications in the the dot summary ecosystem, which we like to call the Paraverse at Talisman. Yeah. Uh, that have kind of uh, done the work to integrate with MetaMask because that's where a lot of the users are. Yeah. And that's kind of the standard application stack for them. Uh, but for a user that have maybe has some substrate assets that have bridged it to an EVM chain to use an EVM dApp, it makes sense for this to be in one wallet. And it makes sense for that to just kind of work out of the box. Uh, right. So for this reason, you can just make sure that you've got Talisman installed, MetaMask not installed. Uh, we've got a flag set by default in the wallet so if you just go connect MetaMask, Talisman should just pop up and uh, and work as Sweet. as a normal integration. Even if the application doesn't know that Talisman exists, T it, totally yeah. normal integration. The other big change that you guys have done recently is organizing by asset rather than by chain, right? Yeah, there's I think there's a tendency to just kind of want to ship new features and just kind of expand the feature set of your of your product indefinitely. Yeah. Uh, but it can lead to maybe like a messy user experience where you really have to roll back and start to rethink some of these concepts. Yeah. And that's almost what we've done with our portfolio view. Um, we've noticed that the positions users are entering themselves across the ecosystem are just getting that bit more complex. Mm. You know, people are transferring tokens from chain to chain. Uh, people are then having multiple accounts with that pattern. Uh, so we've just kind of flipped the abstractions we use to show your assets and show your accounts a bit on their head to essentially future-proof that experience and try and set a pattern for users to say, all right, Maybe this is one way you can view all your assets across the ecosystem. Yeah. Instead of just evolving what everyone's used before and then creating even more of a mess of your, of your kind of portfolio view, we've, uh, 
we've taken a, a step back, decided to consolidate the features that we do have uh, to make a really future-proofed and kind of well-intentioned uh, design philosophy mm -hmm. around this multi-chain ecosystem, which is actually quite unique uh, in that respect. Is there anything else you want to tell us about that's coming up? I mean, last time we spoke, we talked about orbs, things like that. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> no. um, we've got some really, some really nice stuff uh, coming with balances support. Supporting balances in the ecosystem is almost like a cumbersome task at the moment. Uh, where there are lots of different token standards and we have to do mm. all this work to integrate. And one of our engineers has, has created a really awesome library that uh, kind of, for us, again, it kind of future proofs what we're doing um, to make sure that if we want to add support for other assets in the ecosystem or a parachain kind of changes what they're doing with their token standard, the way we can update that in the application is just uh, super quick. So we can, um, we can have like a really robust, safe foundation on what we're building. But Very cool. That's that's sexy for for us engineers and less for users because like <laughs> okay. the outcome is kind of the same. For users, right. uh, it's just make sure that that we have a really nice foundation of technology to build a wallet on. What can you tell us about the Paraverse? This is, as you mentioned, the word you guys use for uh, dot sama. Yeah. Uh, so actually, early on in the Talisman project, uh, Agile. Uh, my co-founder, kind of correctly identified that there's a bit of a naming problem in the ecosystem. Yes. You know, some, some people call the ecosystem the Polkadot ecosystem, yeah. or it's Dotsama, or it's Polkasama. I tried to do Polkasama. You tried, you're the, in the beginning, I tried to do the, Polka. I'm not, I'm not saying I'm the source, but okay. I, I, I want Polkasama to happen. I don't know about that one. Um, yeah, there was, was it Polkadot, Polkasama, <laughs> Kusama, uh, you know, a million ways, to, a million terms for this ecosystem, and yeah. none of them were particularly digestible, let's say. We kind of uh, did the XKCD kind of standards comic and said, look, there are 14 competing standards. <laughs> we need to make sure that everyone's using the same language. So then we created a 15th standard and called <laughs> and called the ecosystem the Paraverse, which nice. I think nicely encapsulates what's really going on, uh, where it's a like, let's say, a universe of different parachains, each offering their own uh, functionality, uh, but all working together. Do you think uh, consensus mechanisms outside of Substrate could be part of the Paraverse one day? Yeah, there are multiple consensus mechanisms uh, inside, like, uh, available to Substrate chains. Mm -hmm. uh, so um, the relay chains are using one and some of the power chains are using different ones. Yeah. So uh, the Substrate, like, blockchain um, toolkit is so versatile that there are already multiple consensus mechanisms inside the Paraverse. Okay. It's very impressive. But what I'm asking yeah. is, like, you know, like, uh, Near and uh, Cosmos and Ethereum, can they be part of the Paraverse one day? I think that, I don't think there's a technical limitation on that. Okay. Um, Interlay doing some really good stuff to bridge Bitcoin into into Substrate. Yeah. And there's no, as far as I understand, it might be tricky, but there's no technical limitation to include these ecosystems in a more meaningful way. Maybe it's just uh, a coordination problem. Yeah. Uh, we have to wrangle these other ecosystems that are really competing with each other to work together. But we're starting to see that more and more with bridges. Yeah, I love bridges. Bridges are awesome. They're very treacherous as well. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Cool, man. All right, thanks for talking to us. Likewise.